lots of carbon-based life forms. Today we're talking about the Renaissance Periodization Scientific Principles of Hypertrophy Training by four people, three doctors, uh, Dr. Mike Isertel, Dr. James Hoffman, Dr. Melissa Davis, and non-Dr. Jared Feather, but he is an IFBB pro uh, recently, uh, sometime in the past month, so congrats to Jared Feather for winning your pro card. Much deserved. Anyway, this book is absolutely packed with mass. It is 377 pages long, and uh, it has some thick spinal erectors. Get it? Because it's a book, and books have spines, and... So this book is definitely not for beginners. Uh, in fact, they give you some prerequisite reading uh, saying that if you're a beginner, read these books first because they're going to give you a good base of knowledge, which this book will then expand upon. Uh, so it is definitely a hard book to get through. It is definitely uh, a little bit dry at times and uh, at 377 pages, it's a bit long as well. So long, hard and dry, not a pleasant evening. So chapter one is specificity. So this is the idea that if you want to improve at any given task, whether it's strength or hypertrophy or endurance or anything, you need to get better at that specific task. So if you want to get better at squatting, squatting is going to be the most specific thing that you can do. However, lunges are not specific, but they are you know similar enough that they can actually build your squat. However, marathon training, it is so dissimilar from squatting that it not only doesn't really help your squat, it might actually compete with your squat for resources and uh, actually lead to a worse result. They also talk about doing multiple sports at the same time. I know Mike Isertel does uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu as well as hypertrophy bodybuilding type of training. And uh, so he definitely has a good deal of expertise there, which a lot of people do not. And you can't have everything. So you need to prioritize some things at different times. Uh, you need to be aware that you have a limited pool of resources with which to recover from. And some things are just going to compete with each other. Now, one thing that I really like is at the end of each chapter, they talk about the over and under application of this principle. So they talk about under application of specificity. So this is where your training is not going to be specific enough to get to your goals. So for example, if your goal is to squat a lot of weight, again, um, if you are just, you know, you're doing lunges, you're not really doing a lot of squatting, and you're doing uh, fucking yoga, and you're doing Pilates, and you're doing, you know, athlete next workouts, you're doing everything except squatting. Yeah, maybe you're building a big base, but it's not really going to be a base that supports your actual goal. Then they talk about over application of specificity. And this is where you're doing nothing but one rep max squatting. And you think, oh, well, this is the most specific thing that can help my squat. But in practice, for a variety of reasons, this is not going to be optimal. They also threw in a nice jab at squats and milk. The idea of squats and milk is like, you do squats, you drink milk, and the squats release testosterone, and the milk gets you swole, and you don't have to train your arms, you just squat, and therefore it just builds everything, man. Well, not really. If you want big arms, you gotta train your arms, okay? It's not like, you know, training a different area is gonna build up a different area. Every muscle is its own machine, and you're not gonna stimulate your arms by squatting, okay? At least not very much. Also throw in a summary of each chapter, which is, you know, still a page and a half in this case. Uh, but this is definitely much needed because it is very dense again. And um, they also throw in references. I mean, chapter one isn't even that long. And it has 30, 40 references. So this is very well researched, very well referenced. And um, this is not bro science by any means. Chapter two was overload, and maybe Ryan Humiston should read this chapter because he thinks progressive overload is only adding weight to the bar, which is definitely not the case, so I think he should uh, educate himself. Yeah, I'm going to fire as many shots as possible wherever in every direction because I don't give a fuck. Then they give probably the best and most useful list ever. It is basically what causes muscle growth. So I'll put it on the screen, basically tension, volume, relative effort, etc., and the, the one, two, three, four, five is going to be the most important. And then it goes less important as you go farther down the list. So muscle damage, actually, it is not that important. A lot of people are like, yeah, bro, tear the chest off of the chest and it'll grow. It'll grow back bigger. The sort of military mentality. And uh, I think Dorian Yates also has this mentality when he was training. Like, oh, I'm just going to do one set and rip the boy sip. Uh, but muscle damage is actually either not important or counterproductive, you know, the research is still sort of accumulating, hey. um, 
but it's definitely not a major focus. You're going to want to focus on tension, um, progressive overload, volume, and relative effort. Those are going to be what is actually going to matter when it comes to hypertrophy training. So then it spends the next 100 or so pages going into detail on each of these and more, and it was really good. However, there were two things that were huge red flags and definitely caught my eye, which I just need to address. The first one is going to be their definition of a giant set. Their definition was, oh, you have 30 reps of pull-ups, and you do pull-ups and try to get as few sets as possible to get to 30 pull-ups. So you might go like 10, 8, 7, and then you just go on and on until you get to 30 pull-ups, which is a fine way to train, but it's not a giant set, okay? Any definition that I've ever seen or heard or learned of has been a giant set is several sets back to back. So you might do squats, followed by lunges, followed by leg extensions, followed by split squats. And I don't really like the style of training, to be perfectly honest, but that is a giant set. If you Google giant space set, not like outer space, like, but giant then a space, then a, you know, the word set, that is the definition that you will get every time. Like if you scroll through 10 pages of Google results, every single result will have that as a giant set, this, this sort of superset followed by a superset followed by a superset. Um, so I don't know why they're using this definition. I think there's already an established definition for giant sets. So there's no real point in taking that name and applying it to something completely different. Second one is the use of myo reps. And there's two things that are wrong with this. The first, myo reps were created by Borg Fageli, Fageli, something like that. I don't actually know how to pronounce his name, but he definitely created myo reps. They are his baby. They are one of his life's work, okay? And they didn't reference him at all. So they basically took the name of what he created and put it in the book without referencing him. I did a video on Maya Reps and I referenced Borges' website in my video because they are his, basically. He invented them. And if you Google Maya Reps, the first thing that comes up is an article by Barbell Medicine. And again, in the first paragraph, they reference Borges because he created them. He invented it, okay? It's not like a rest pause training. It's a specific form of rest pause training that he created. Second, they didn't even get it right. Myo reps is where you do a set to failure or very, very close to failure, one rep before failure. Then you do multiple mini sets of three to five reps. He's very, very clear about this. Three to five reps. Not six, not seven, not eight. Three to five with short rests. Now, their version of myo reps is five to ten reps. That is something completely different, okay? When you're doing my reps and you're doing this kind of rest pause, let's say you're doing pull downs, you know, you're failing at four to five reps, maybe even three reps. So getting five to 10 reps on that, you know, mini set afterwards, it's a completely different sensation and a completely different workout. So I don't know why they took the name and then also changed it as well. Maybe it's just a, a telephone game where, you know, someone told someone else, someone told someone else and, you know, something got lost in translation. But still, if they're going to use the word myo reps, credit Borge and then also be accurate as well. Anyway, moving on from that, uh, I do really like how they are typically very, very honest. So they are definitely team full range of motion for sure. But they also say, OK, maybe full range of motion isn't always the best thing to do. So there's a level of nuance that I really like. They sort of play devil's advocate. They say, OK, well, High frequency is good, but under some circumstances, maybe not that good. Full range of motion is good, but under some circumstances, maybe not so good. And they sort of like play a game of tennis with themselves, which I think is good. And you can get both sides of the story and you still have to think, okay? It's not telling you the answer, but you're going to get better results because you have to think. A good fitness book should make you think more, not less. And one thing they continuously harp on is that you need to feel it. So mind muscle connection isn't something you can read in a book. Stimulus to fatigue ratio, you know, which exercises are going to be the best for you for hypertrophy. It's going to be personal for some people. They find bench pressing is amazing for chest growth. Other people, not so much. Same for squats, same for deadlifts, same for any movement. It's going to be individual and it's something that you can learn to feel and, you know, you can get a good guideline from a book, but it needs to be done through experience. 
Also, throughout the book, a few times they give you these little quizzes where it's like zero, one, two, or three. You know, how much of a pump did you get from this exercise? How much of a mind muscle connection? How much soreness? How much disruption, etc.? Uh, which I think can be a sort of objective way to tell if an exercise is good for you. And、uh, I think this is a good way how to translate theory into practicality. Another thing that I found. Uh, and, and again, this book is very well researched, very well referenced.、Uh, I'll just read the sentence. I'll put it on the screen too. A very large degree of central nervous system fatigue from other life stressors such as work or relationships can also impose limits that reduce the stimulus you were able to apply to the target muscle. And so I saw this, and I was like, okay. So if your boss yells at you, it can impact your central nervous system. It can give you central nervous system fatigue. And I'm like, hmm. So I clicked on the reference. And it did say that life stress can reduce your performance, but it didn't mention central nervous system fatigue anywhere. So, you know, if some if the article doesn't say something about central nervous system fatigue, you could say it reduces your performance because that's what the article said. But I think it's a huge leap to say, oh, I broke up with my girlfriend, and therefore it's my central nervous system that is fatigued. So then, chapter three, they got into fatigue management, and they got a little bit technical at times. They talked about Amtor, AMPK, cytokines, cortisol, etc.、Uh, but I think they went into the right amount of depth here.、Uh, they didn't like drown you in physiology. Fellas, I think I'm sinking here. Shut up! No one's talking to you. Oh yeah, yeah, I'm sinking. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I'm sinking. Help! Oh, I can't reach it, man. Throw it again. Go, go, go! Somebody help! Oh, I'm going down. Okay. Alright, slow breaths. Slow breaths. Okay. You okay, ma'am? Oh yeah. Alright.、Uh, but they gave you the terms that if you want to go search them and find out more, you definitely can.、Uh, overall, here they talked about deloads. They talked about stimulus to fatigue ratio. They talked about. You know the importance of good technique. They talked about SFR versus volume, etc. Chapter four was stimulus recovery and adaptation, or SRA. So basically, this is、uh, you have a training session. It stimulates muscle growth, but it also causes some recovery cost that you need to fix. And it's often thought of、uh, recovery and growth as being the same thing, but they're not. Okay, you can recover and not grow, and、um, that happens all the time. You know, people survive training, but they don't actually grow. Because their training is not set up in the right way. So if you're still watching this, you might have the patience to actually be able to go through this book and benefit from it. If you've already left this video, probably not for you. One thing that I kind of missed from it was humor. If you watch one of Mike's videos, I think that's a huge selling point. He is a funny guy, and you know that's half the reason why I click on his videos because I know he has a great sense of humor, and you know I'm probably gonna laugh. If not out loud, at some point in the video, Jared is also really funny, and you know, seeing them interact on Instagram is you know often very very entertaining, and you know, I would think that having two of them as the authors, being half of the authors, some of that humor would have made its way into the book, but it really didn't at all.、Uh, I didn't have any. There were really no jokes. It was sort of. Very, very professionally written, which I guess is a good thing. They were going for more professionalism rather than a more casual tone.、Um, but for me personally, it's something that I kind of missed. And、um, you know, a video is definitely more entertaining on that side of things. Then it goes into variety variations, and you can vary the exercises, velocity, loading, volume, training method.、Uh, you know, using myo reps, drop sets, etc. The exercise order. And、uh, you know this was a good chapter. Again, it goes into just a ton of detail. This this section is probably forty or fifty pages. So if you want to know a lot about exercise variation, this is definitely an excellent resource. Then chapters、uh, six and seven are phase potentiation. I don't know why they didn't just say periodization, and then individualization. And、um, my overall thoughts on the book: I think it is extremely comprehensive.、Uh, you know, if you have a question about The intersection of reps and reserve, and RPE, and volume, and frequency, and intensity, and intensiveness, and progression, and you know how that relates to injury and deloading, and how to set up a training plan.、Uh, the answer is in here somewhere. You know, if you're willing to go digging,、uh, I think you can absolutely benefit from this. If you don't like reading, obviously not the book for you. 
Um, but if you're a serious athlete, I think this can be a great resource. If you're a beginner, not really for you. But then again, they tell you that it's not for you. They say, you know, right up front, this is not a book for beginners. Go read these instead to give you a base of knowledge. Uh, intermediates, I would say if you are on the nerdy side, like I am, you know, you might benefit from this. You might enjoy it. Uh, don't expect to finish it in one sitting. I think this took five sittings or something for me. Um, just because it is a lot to chew through. If you're advanced, if you're a serious bodybuilder, I think this is going to be an excellent resource. Um, but just, you know, realize it is a lot to go through. It is a bit much. And um, if nothing else, just get it to support all of the absurd amounts of free, awesome information that they put out. It's only like $37 or something. Someone actually bought it for me this time. I didn't actually have to buy it myself, which was nice after that $199 fiasco last time uh i might as well compare it to greg's book and my book because there's some overlap uh compared to greg's book obviously much more comprehensive but then again different target audience compared to my book also a lot more in detail i think it's actually a good compliment to my book uh if you bought my book and you enjoyed the sections on you know programming but you want to know more this is going to be a good resource you know my book it does go into a little bit of detail but not nearly as much as this. You know, I really like the charts in this book as well. It had, you know, very well drawn, well laid out and logically drawn charts, which is good, which is, you know, I'm again, I'm a econ stat nerd, so for me I enjoy that, but I think this book is going to be dependent on your level and on your personality. Finally, they actually say in the closing statement, keep in mind that the recommendations in this book are for absolutely optimal results and that adhering to them perfectly is not realistic for everyone. And, you know, I would say I completely agree with this. You know, you don't need a perfect training program to get very good results. This is like for people who are really trying to eke out that last two to three, maybe five percent of their gains, of their strength gains, of their physique optimality or whatever um, and don't stress if your program or if your diet or if your lifestyle is not a hundred percent perfect that is all for this video make sure to like uh, I just read 400 pages of exercise nerd porn for you guys all right. slow breaths slow breaths subscribe to the channel notifications on and I will see you in that next video peace